Hi, welcome to the Macintosh Survival Course, a guide to data recovery and troubleshooting basic software and hardware problems that can affect the efficient operation of your Macintosh. Before we get started, why don't we take a look at the materials that accompany this videotape. First, we have a workbook that contains exercises and in-depth material that expand upon the tape. We also have a shareware disk that contains useful Macintosh utilities. And you have a toolkit that will assist you in performing simple repairs and upgrades to your Mac. Let's start with some solutions to many of the disasters that can strike. It's important to understand what can go wrong and prepare a disaster kit that can help you when the bad stuff happens. What can go wrong? <laughs> Everything. And at the worst possible time. Just as you are completing that 20-page report you've been too busy to save, your leg will find a way to kick out the power cord. Power loss and fluctuations, thunderstorms, spikes, surges, brownouts, shared circuits, all can and will cause havoc within your computer system that can potentially damage or destroy your hardware and software. Shutting off your Mac improperly. This can confuse the operating system as well as damage your hard disk. Problem software. Very few software products are released bug free. And even though Apple maintains strict standards which software developers should follow, shortcuts are awfully tempting. Hardware failure. Surveys have shown that your hard disk's mean time between failures is between 11,000 and 20,000 hours of operation. Computers will break no matter how well you take care of them. Viruses. If you don't take precautionary measures, viruses can turn your Mac into a big paperweight. Have you ever had a floppy disk eject for no apparent reason? Or maybe you started your Mac up in the morning and it wouldn't boot. Or perhaps you couldn't launch an application from its icon. Or your Mac reported a system error and stopped. Or your coworker accidentally deleted a proposal an hour before an important meeting with the client. Or a file's icon is on the screen, but you can't get into the file. You say you've been using a Mac for years and nothing bad has ever happened? Ha! <laughs> Wait. Time and providence are against you. So, you might as well prepare your disaster kit now while everything is working fine. First, you need a bootable disk that has emergency software on it. Second, you need to do backups on a consistent basis like every day you use your Mac. Third, you need to understand how your Macintosh operates. There are many RAM, ROM, operating system, and hardware functions that you need to know about to keep your Mac operating at peak efficiency. Fourth, you should learn to use at least one data recovery package and one virus prevention package. Gee, that sounds an awful lot like the topics we cover in this video. Knowing how the system works along with some simple yet valuable troubleshooting techniques could save you much time, aggravation, and money. Since we have limited time in this video presentation, we have included in your package a workbook that will guide you through all the interactive exercises covered in this tape, as well as reference information that explores the many topics in detail we can only touch upon in the video. Please turn to your workbook and review the video index. You may want to skip certain sections depending on your Mac experience.
Let's start with the Max operating system. In this section, you will learn what the operating system is, how it interacts and is complemented by special Mac utilities, and you will see how you can easily fix common memory problems and software conflicts. The most crucial component of a computer software is the operating system. It is a special program, a group of programs, that contain fundamental instructions for controlling the basic tasks that operate the computer. These programs are called the Macintosh system software. The system software's tasks include memory management, input-output processing, applications program execution, file management, and creating a user interface. In the Macintosh, a large piece of its system software resides in ROM, which is read-only memory. Read-only memory is permanent memory stored in ROM chips that provide low-level startup, diagnostic, and system management routines. After you hear the bong during startup, the Mac loads its system management programs called managers. These managers contain the primary operating system code. Once these programs are loaded into the computer's RAM or random access memory, the disk-based part of the operating system takes over. The disk-based portion of the Mac operating system resides in the system folder. The files in the system folder contain routines which Apple has created or upgraded since creating the ROM chips, the finder software, the fonts that appear in your application's font menu, and dialog boxes, the desk accessories that appear in the Apple menu, the auxiliary files used by the chooser and control panel desk accessories, the text or graphics which you've pasted into the scrapbook desk accessory, and any other utilities, sounds, or assorted interesting stuff you put in there. The startup disk is the hard or floppy disk that contains the active system folder. The most important files in the system folder are the system file and the finder. Having these two files on a disk makes it a bluable disk. The system file holds the Mac's disk-based operating system. It also holds many shared resources which applications look for while operating. The finder is a special application that works with the system file. It has the primary responsibility for providing the Mac's graphic user interface. One of the first things we must stress is the need to have extra boot disks handy at all times. Don't bet your life insurance that the Mac will always boot from the hard disk. To make a boot disk, first initialize an 800K or 1.4 meg floppy so it will accept Macintosh files. Initialization and disk density issues are detailed in your workbook. Next, open the system folder and drag the system file and the finder to the floppy disk. If your Mac reports there is no room on your floppy to accept your system file, use your Mac's installer. The installer only copies the parts of the system file and folder the Mac needs to boot, along with all the special routines specific Mac models require. For more details on using the installer, please refer to your workbook. System 7 cannot be installed on low-density floppies. If you do not have a high-density drive, use the disk tools disk that comes with System 7. One of the reasons the Mac has proven so popular is because it was written to emulate the way people really work. The Macintosh handles multitasking. This allows you to open several applications and or data files at the same time and switch among them. Also, to make the power of the microcomputer easy for anyone to harness, its designers created on-screen versions of things people use every day. For example, desktops, push buttons, fine controls, and my favorite, the trash can. Executable files are also called programs. The finder is a program that manages the desktop. 
It contains the broad instructions to do the actual, actual work of drawing icons and windows, opening documents, and launching applications. Many people describe the Finder as the Apple's operating system, but this is not true. Think of the Finder as sort of a middle person between you and your application. The Finder runs immediately after you start your Mac and also takes over when you quit an application. When you double click on a document, the Finder determines which application created it and starts that, that application automatically. The Finder lets you place the file and folder icons wherever you like on the desktop. The Finder's Get Info command lets you find out information about files, attach brief descriptive phrases to them, and alter the memory requirement of applications. Using System 6 Special Menus Startup command, you can instruct your Mac to start up running MultiFinder, the Finder, or some other application. System 7 does not use MultiFinder. It is always multitasking. System 7 users also do not have the startup command, but there is a special startup items folder in the system folder into which you can drag any program or file. In System 6 and earlier, the finder creates and maintains an invisible file named the desktop on every disk you use. The desktop file contains a number of things the Finder uses as it works. Get info comments, locations of disks and icons, the way the contents of disks and folders are displayed on the desktop, and the icons for each application and for documents the application creates. System 7 uses a new manager, the desktop manager, to perform these functions. So, you can see the Finder has a lot of responsibility. A lot can go wrong if the finder is somehow damaged or destroyed, or if the finder should run into trouble communicating with the desktop. The Macintosh operating system uses a number of special programs that add to what the computer can do for you. One type of program is the desk accessory. You can find these DAs in the Apple menu. Here you see an alarm clock, calculator, chooser, control panel, and a whole bunch of others. Applications such as commercial data recovery and optimizing packages will add partitioning DAs, text locating DAs, and many more. DAs are also listed in the system folder. There are other useful little programs running around in your Mac. A CDEV control panels in System 7 is a control panel device. If you access your control panel under the Apple menu, you will see your installed CDEVs. CDEVs are utilities you can configure and customize. CDEVs are also listed in your system folder. Your workbook discusses many of the CDEVs available, but we want to mention one important one here. That is the general CDEV or memory in System 7. General or memory lets you make adjustments to your Mac's display and desktop. What we want to mention here is the RAM cache. Actually, the cache is a special memory area, sometimes referred to as a smart buffer. This cache holds information on the folders, files, and applications, which you have been using in a session, thereby speeding up data and program access. It also controls the number of programs and DAs you can use simultaneously. As you see, you can increase or decrease the size of the cache using the little arrows to the right of its size indicator. The preset and maximum sizes of the cache depend on the amount of RAM in your Mac. If you want to open more programs than memory allows, set the cache to a smaller size. System 7 adds two new features to your Mac, 32-bit addressing and virtual memory. Some Macintoshes can use very large amounts of RAM, more than 8 megabytes, by taking advantage of 32-bit addressing. Virtual memory allows your Mac to use hard disk space as memory. Hard devs are another type of utility found within the chooser.
These allow you to select your printers or network devices. Our devs are installed when you set up your printer or other device. Another type of utility is called the init. An init is activated automatically when you start your Mac. These inits, when activated, are loaded into a specific address area in RAM and will remain there until you turn your machine off. If you have more than one init needing the same space, or if an application decides it needs a certain memory address occupied by the init, you can have a RAM tug of war. Such a conflict could freeze your system, damage the application or data, or cause generally unacceptable behavior. If you suspect this is a problem, change the name of the init. The Mac loads in in alphabetical order, and a different loading order might solve the problem. If you're not sure where the problem is, remove all the nits and put them back one at a time. You'll know when you hit the offender. If changing an init's name doesn't work, try working without the init. System 7 handles all these little programs differently than previous versions of the operating system software. In previous system versions, you had to install DAs with the font DA mover. Now, all you need to do is drag the DA's icon to the system folder's icon and release. The system folder will then ask if you want to place the DA in the Apple Items folder within the system folder. The control panels are now stored in the control panels folder within the system folder. There are now separate folders for extensions and startup items. When you want to install any special utility, just drag its icon to the system folder's icon. The system folder will try to place it in the proper folder. It also creates a special suitcase for DAs used with previous system software versions. We have already mentioned one adjustment you can make to the way your Mac's operating system handles random access memory, or RAM, which is your computer's workspace, but what happens when things in there begin to run out of room or disagree? Well, you could add more memory, or you could try making a few simple software adjustments. How do you know if you're having memory problems? Any of these error messages could be an indication. or your system suddenly stops or restarts for no apparent reason. The Mac operating system gives each application part of memory, called a partition. The application requests a partition of a certain size. Sometimes the application is a little conservative in its request, or you may have many things active, thereby cutting down the amount of RAM available. When there is not enough memory allocated for an application, it can behave strangely or crash you can adjust the amount of memory provided to an application. To do this, first highlight the application's icon then go to the file menu and choose Get Info. At the bottom of the Get Info window you will see the suggested memory size and a box in which you can change the application memory size. Be careful when you change this setting. The more memory you assign to an application, the less there is for other system resources. If you need to open a large number of applications, you can decrease an application's partition. Doing this, however, can cause the application to behave strangely or crash. If you have System 7, you can use virtual memory if you want to open additional programs or work with extremely large documents. The memory control panel automatically sets the same amount of virtual memory as there is regular RAM installed in your system. Because virtual memory is slower than regular memory, increasing this setting can slow your system. 
Not all Macs can take advantage of virtual memory. First, you need System 7. Second, you must have a PMMU, or Page Memory Management Unit chip. If you open and close a number of programs, your Mac's memory can become fragmented. When this happens, you may not be able to open another program, even if you know there's enough memory free for that program. To solve this problem, exit the other applications you have running. If that doesn't work, restart your Mac. Just be sure to save everything first. Finally, there is the system heap. Without getting too technical, the heap is a portion of memory set aside for handling the system and applications. You generally don't have to worry about the application heaps, but you do need to watch the system heap if you are running with many applications open. To view your system heap, bring down the Apple menu and activate about this Macintosh, about the finder in system six. The heap bar should be at least one third empty when no applications are open. There are commercial utilities available to adjust the heap. There is another simple fix you might try when the Mac operating system gets a little strange. Zapping the pram allows you to clear the memory kept alive by your computer's battery. Pram, by the way, stands for parameter RAM. Ready to zap some pram? As the Mac is running, hold down the command option and shift keys. Then select control panel from the Apple menu. Your Mac will come back and ask if you really want to zap the pram. Click yes. Restart your Mac. It will rebuild the parameter RAM during the startup process. You might need to reset the system's clock and calendar through the control panel. We've covered a lot of ground so far, so let's step back and make sure all this is clear. One, the Mac's operating system is partially ROM-based and partially located on disk. Two, the ROM-based portion of the operating system contains a number of managers that handle low-level system functions. Three, the disk-based portion of the operating system controls the daily activities of your Macintosh, including RAM management and file storage. Four, the system file contains the disk-based Macintosh operating system. Five, there are a number of other programs, sometimes called utilities, that complement the operating system's task. Six, system extensions include DAs, CDEVs, RDEVs, and INITs. These are different types of utilities, little applications, available for the Mac. Seven, be aware of the RAM management problems that can occur on the Mac. Eight, if strange things begin to happen, first, deinstall MultiFinder if you are running pre-System 7 system software versions. Nine, if that doesn't help, try to reorganize your NITs and DAs. 10, check each application's partition. 11, you may need to adjust the system heap. And 12, zapping the pram might help you out if you cannot locate devices. So far, we have talked quite a bit about RAM and a few of the problems we can run into there. The next critical area we need to look at is the disk. Macintosh disks are filing cabinets for all our folders and files. They store our applications and our important networking components. Therefore, we need to know as much about them as possible if we are going to recover our data when things go wrong. This part of the video will cover, one, fundamentals of disk operations, two, how the Mac operating system stores data on disks, three, what can go wrong with the Mac's bookkeeping, four, 
how you can recover lost or damaged files quickly and painlessly. Five, how you can get a hard disk booting again when it simply refuses. And six, how to optimize your disk to ensure prolonged good service. To help us illustrate the bookkeeping structures of your Mac's operating system, and to illustrate available data recovery and optimizing tools, we will be demonstrating the Norton Utilities. If you don't have it, don't worry. Your Sum 2, Mac Tools, or other package will be fine. A data storage disk is very similar to a magnetic tape. A fine powder of metallic oxide particles are applied to a plastic support surface or substrate. As the disk spins, areas on the disk are passed over an electromagnet. This is called a read-write head. There's one head for each side of the disk. The job of the read-write head is to change the little metallic particles on the surface of the disk into little magnets. Now, to make the task of finding data a little easier for the read-write head, the disk is divided into magnetic structures called tracks and sectors. Remember phonograph records? As you look at one, you see the circular tracks on which the needle rests. Although you cannot see them on the computer disk, they are there. The tracks are then further divided into sectors, much as a pizza is divided into slices. Each sector holds 512 bytes of information. Tracks and sectors are laid down on the disk by a process called low-level formatting. This type of formatting is performed by software that comes with your hard drive. It has nothing to do with the Macintosh operating system. The Mac operating system does perform a type of formatting, referred to as initialization. When you initialize a disk, the Mac operating system sets up several directory areas that keep track of where your data and program files are located on the disk. Without these special file management areas, the Mac operating system would have to search each sector in sequence while looking for a file. So remember, there are two types of formatting, low level or physical, and high level, or the Mac's operating system's logical formatting. Low-level formatting sets up the tracks and sectors on which data can be put down. If you perform a low-level format on a disk that has data stored on it, all that data will be gone. Performing a low-level format on your hard disk can fix sectors that have broken down magnetically over a period of time. Problems reading or writing to your disk could signal this condition, as well as data being relocated during optimization. Be aware, however, that a low-level format will destroy all the data on your disk. Be sure to back up everything first, and don't interrupt the formatter during its run. The high-level formatting, or initialization, set the, sets up the file management structures the Mac OS needs to keep track of where things are on a disk. You may be surprised to learn that reformatting a hard disk does not destroy your data. However, all the file management, bookkeeping structures, the Mac uses to keep track of your data will be reset. Your Mac OS will not be able to find the data that's still on the disk. How floppy disks and hard disks operate are similar, but there are a few fundamental differences. First, a hard disk's read-write heads do not touch the disk. They actually float above the disk on a very narrow stream of air. When you turn off the computer, the heads will lower onto the surface of the disk, resting upon data or bookkeeping information. If this happens while the disk is in operation, it could cause a head crash, a most unpleasant and damaging experience for your disk and a sure loss of data for you. To avoid such a catastrophe, you should use the special menus shutdown command whenever you want to end a session with your Mac. Shutdown positions your read-write heads onto an area of the disk where there is no information. Also, when you initialize a floppy, the Mac operating system first performs a low-level format. Unlike hard disks, if you initialize a floppy, you've lost everything. 
Let me clear off my desk and start the system so I can show you partitioning. Macintosh disks can be partitioned. A partition is a logical volume on a disk, kind of like putting a divider into a large filing cabinet. Partitioning reduces the RAM required to handle large hard disks. It also speeds up your disk access time since the read-write heads do not have to move across the entire disk for all reads and writes. Partitioning reduces the chance that the Mac operating system will lose a file, where a file or folder vanishes for no apparent reason. And partitioning can help you cut down on nested folders within your own filing system, helping you keep better track of where things are. Partitioning your hard disk will allow you to assign any free space on your disks to the new volume. You give it a name, allocate the amount of space, and set the options provided by the partitioning software, usually passwords and other security options. The new partition will be available to you when you mount it or make it active. Each partition is treated by the Mac operating system as a separate disk, each with its own desktop file and bookkeeping areas. Now that we have talked about the surface of the disk, how data is stored as magnets, the functions of low-level and high-level formatting, as well as partitioning, let's go a little deeper and see how the Mac uses the disk to store all your important stuff. Why do you need to know this information? Well, mostly, it will help you better understand error messages when you see them. Plus, you will know what your data recovery tools are doing as they do their work. In addition, the more technical among you will see how to operate some very powerful application software. And finally, learning new stuff is fun. It's interesting to see how things work. Floppy disks can hold hundreds of files. Hard disks can hold thousands. The Mac provides a way to efficiently organize the contents of your disks. It's called the Hierarchical File System, or HFS. With HFS, organizing your disk's files is much like organizing paperwork within a filing cabinet. The disk is similar to a filing cabinet and is the topmost level of the hierarchy. Disk folders compared to the paper folders in the filing cabinet's drawers and can hold applications and data. While you are working with folders, the Mac is working with a directory and a bunch of pointers. A directory is a data structure that keeps track of the location of a file on a disk, similar to the table of contents in a book. A pointer leads the Mac from its directory to the actual location of a file on a disk. The directories are what I have been calling the Mac's bookkeeping structure. In order to view the various file management or bookkeeping structures on a hard disk, you need a special utility called a sector editor. The sector editor allows you to get beneath the surface of your desktop to see everything there is to see on your disk, such as the bookkeeping areas, the boot blocks, the volume info block, the volume bitmap, the expense B tree, and the catalog B tree. Unfortunately, Apple does not provide us with such a tool, so we need to go get some extra help. In this video, we will be using the sector editor from the Norton Utilities, called Disk Editor. Since you can follow along with me as we delve into the hidden recesses of your hard disk, you should get yourself comfortable in front of your Mac with the Norton Utilities fully installed on your hard disk. 
If you have another set of utilities that has a sector editor, fine. Be sure to locate your VCR's pause button. <laughs> You'll need it as we go from the video description to your user's manual. Or you might just want to sit back and watch and try all this stuff later. Whichever, you can put me on pause until you're ready to continue. Back already? Great, let's get started. From the Norton main menu, select Norton Utilities. Next, select Norton Disk Editor. Okay, choose your current system disk. Now, before we continue, be aware that we are exploring very sensitive areas of your disk. Should your fingers slip a little, you could render your disk inoperable. Well, unbootable at least. When you start up your Mac, it's in the same position as a person confronted with a locked filing cabinet. Your Mac, however, knows where to find the key to your startup disk. It's called the boot blocks, and they are located at the beginning of the disk. Choose objects, and choose boot blocks. The boot blocks are in absolute sector zero, the very start of the physical disk. You can see these boot blocks contain information that describes the disk and some of the Mac's operating system resources. Also, the boot blocks help identify where the logical disk begins. The boot process needs to know where the operating system begins. Notice, as I highlight each item, Norton explains that item. Now, what does all this information mean? The signature bytes tell the boot process whether or not the disk is a valid Mac data or program disk. Then, there are the names or versions of operating system files, the finder, uh, debugger, the disassembler, and the clipboard file. The Mac also looks for the name of the startup screen, if any. This screen is shown just after the smiling Mac that appears during startup. The value stored for Mac's files indicates how much memory should be set aside for the file control blocks, or FCBs. These are used to keep track of open documents. FCBs are stored in RAM. Each contains, among other things, the exact location of the file on disk, the current position in the open file, etc. The event queue size tells the Mac how many events, keystrokes, mouse clicks, etc., to remember at once. The value in event queue size determines how far ahead you can type or click while your Mac is doing something else. Generally, about 20 events can be stacked. Finally, the Mac learns where the actual bootstrap program or code begins and what it contains. Now, let's investigate the Volume Info block or VIB. Select Objects, select Volume Info block. The Volume Info block immediately follows the boot blocks on the disk, Absolute Sector 2. It accesses the key to the disk volume, partition. A very important piece of information in the VIB is the allocation block size. Physically, data is stored in sectors, but your operating system uses a different minimum size for blocks of data. On some disks, it will be one sector per allocation block. On larger disks, allocation blocks will be two to four sectors. Each file on your disk occupies a whole number of blocks. Blocks cannot be split between files. Any unused space within a block is wasted. The Mac assigns extra blocks to a file when you first create it. This clump size allows extra room in which the file can grow, cutting down on fragmentation. Clump size is also stored in the VIB.
volume attributes keep track of the disk volume status. It is two bytes or 16 bits long. Each bit refers to an attribute, each of which is like a switch that may be set on or off. The finder checks these switches, flags, to see if a volume is eligible to be operated on in certain ways. The blessed folder location contains the file number assigned to the folder containing the currently active system file. Using this number and the system file name found in the boot blocks, the Mac operating system can find the system file. The startup application folder tells the operating system where to find the application, the number of the folder that will run whenever the boot process is completed. This is normally either the finder or multi-finder. The volume bitmap points to the position on the disk where the volume bitmap is located. The purpose of the bitmap is to keep track of what file allocation blocks on the disk are in use, allocated, and which aren't. The first sector in the bitmap's entry lets the operating system know where the data area of your disk begins. Locate the absolute sector horizontal scroll bar at the top left of your screen. Click on the bar's right arrow until the number shown below the bar is the same as that shown for the beginning of the volume bitmap. Each pair of Fs equals eight allocated blocks. Anything else signifies unallocated blocks, meaning the blocks have no files assigned to them. How can that happen? Well, you'll see later. Let's return to the VIB. The next four items in the VIB point to some of the most critical bookkeeping areas on the disk, the extents and catalog tree sizes and club sizes. The extents and catalog trees are data structures used to keep track of the exact location of file data on the disk volume. The data here in the VIB tell the Mac operating system how big each structure is and how much space to add if it fills up and has to be expanded. The last two fields in the VIB tell the Mac operating system where each of these data structures begins and how big they are. This information is very important when it comes to locating files on a disk. So, you see that the first three sectors on your bootable disk contain important information your Mac's boot process needs to get itself started. If something corrupts these areas, such as a power surge or a virus, it will seem to look like a hardware problem, when it's really a software problem. Let's take a moment now to discuss how the Mac boots itself. At this point, we are in the same position your Mac is in after it finishes booting up and proceeds to launch the startup application, which usually is either the finder or multi-finder. The Mac must first pass a series of internal self-tests, called the power on self-test, or post. If all is well, the Mac sounds its startup musical chord and initializes the hardware components. If all is not well, you will see an error message, or hear a sound other than the usual musical chord. That sound tells you there's a RAM problem. Next, memory is tested. A complete test occurs only from a cold boot. The start manager determines which CPU is installed and the clock rate at which it is running. The Mac next initializes key memory values used by the operating system and its various ROM-based managers. The system next sets up the system heap. The desktop is drawn and the arrow pointer appears. Now we have to find the Macintosh operating system on a disk and turn control over to the finder. The start manager looks for a startup device. First, it checks the floppy drives, then looks for a hard drive. Once system manager finds the startup disk, it reads the system startup information from that drive. Remember the boot blocks? The system file on the current startup drive is open, and the Mac's resource manager, system error handler, and font manager are initialized. The Happy Mac icon, then the Welcome to Macintosh message is displayed. At this point, all init files in the current system folder are loaded and executed in alphabetical order. 
the size of the system heap is adjusted as needed. And these startup applications specified in the finder's set startup command are started. Otherwise, the finder starts. There are four startup icons that display information on the status of the computer during startup. Happy Macintosh icon appears when the post tests pass with no problems. Sad Macintosh icon appears when the post finds a problem with the hardware. Many things could be wrong. Bad disk, cable, logic chip, power, or ROM problems. If the problem is RAM related, you should see a numeric code or hear a tone. You are not in for fun if this happens. Question mark icon indicates the computer passed the post but can't find the operating system. With floppy startup disks, you might just have forgotten to put the startup disk in the floppy drive. With hard disks, you might have a problem with the system folder. The best way to fix this problem is to reinstall the operating system. You may also have to reinstall your system extensions. X icon. Normally, your Mac will eject the startup floppy because it doesn't recognize it as a valid startup disk. The problem could be you put in the wrong disk or the boot blocks are damaged. If it's a hard disk based system, you will probably need to run a repair utility, which we will discuss later. Other problems? Like what? Can't load the finder? Okay, start up your Mac from another startup disk. Then, reinstall the operating system. Sorry, a system error has occurred. Uh, a lot of things could be wrong here. Follow the sequence. Always start up from a floppy. One, if you have just added a startup program, init, remove it and restart from the hard disk. Earlier in this video, we discussed init problems. You might want to rewind the tape and review the material. Two, replace the system files. Be sure to drag the old ones to the trash first. Three, reinstall your hard disk drivers. Use your hard disk setup program. Four, zap the pram. The pram's data may have become corrupted. And five, run a diagnostic and repair utility. We will discuss these a bit later. No hard disk icon? Okay, first zap the pram. If that doesn't work, rebuild the desktop. We'll talk about how to do that later. Finally, open up the system and check all cables and SCSI terminators and addresses. We mentioned the Mac needs to find its system file in order to boot successfully. And for us to perform data recovery magic, we will often need to find information that has been lost. Also, should the B tree structure of a data floppy become corrupt, the disk will be ejected from your Mac. Unless you have utilities that will help you fix these areas, the data is lost. So, in order to better understand the Mac filing system, error messages, and the work of important diagnostic utilities, refer to your workbook. Oh, I'm glad you made it through the exercise. Again, why would you want to know all this? One, understanding how the Mac handles its files helps us locate files when the Mac can't. Two, we can edit files, especially text files, if we don't have their application. Three, we can fix problems with the file structure, especially headers and the file markers, internal corruption, bad sectors, and type creator information. Four, we can coax an application into accepting a damaged file. Five, we can find, view, and get hard copy of data that seems to be lost. And six, hopefully, with new releases of these utilities, we will be able to actually select and lift good data off the disk. We can't go into more detail about these fixes in the video, but you can in your workbook. So, you now understand how the Mac keeps track of its files. The Mac uses both file numbers and names when organizing its filing structure. A set of pointers, index records, directs the OS as it searches for the exact locations of folders and files on a disk. If a file is badly fragmented, the OS needs to search both the catalog and extents B trees to assemble the file. Now, let's take a newly initialized disk and see how these structures are built and exactly how they work. Our goal here is to see how all the structures we have seen actually work. What happens when you add a folder and a file to a disk? 
How do they point to each other? What happens when you erase a file? And, most importantly, what happens when all this gets messed up? And how do we fix it? Now, turn to your workbook and complete this section. Now, let's look at what happens if we erase this file. On this disk, we have three files. Example 1, 2, and 3. Before we unerase this file, go to your workbook to find out about how files are created and what happens when they are erased. When a file is deleted, actually, when the trash is emptied, all pointers to that file are zeroed out in the catalog and extends B trees. The pointers corresponding to the file's physical positions on the disk are zeroed out in the volume bitmap. Finally, the desktop file is adjusted to get rid of the file's icon. That's it. The file's data remains on the disk until another file actually overwrites the data. Now, using the sector editor, We could search for any data in the file. Then, print the screen out and use that printout to retype the file. Or, we could use an unerase program. This will do the searching, then create a new file for us. Access unerase from Norton's main menu. If you are still in the sector editor, you will find unerase in the utilities menu. Select the drive that has the file you want to unerase. Next, unerase will ask you for the unerase method you want to use. If you have Norton's file saver feature turned on, quick unerase will bring things back with the greatest of ease. File saver keeps the bookkeeping information for a file intact even after you've dumped the trash for a specified amount of time. If you do not have File Save Active, choose the second option, Scan for Specific File Types. This is the method we will use. Now, let's take a close look at the Unerase screen. After you click on the OK button, Unerase will ask you for the application you created your document within. As you can see, most major Macintosh-based applications are represented in this list. I created these documents using right now 2.2. Although version 2.2 is not to be found in this list, 2.0 uses the same file format. After I click the Do It button, Unerase searches the disk for all erased files that match right now's formatting. Remember the header we saw earlier? After Unerase completes its search, it will list the files it found in the unerased screen. You'll notice the names are probably much different than what these files were called originally. But that's okay. The important thing is we found the files. We can always rename them later. Now, I'm not sure which file is which, so I'm going to select the file I want to inspect. Then click the View File button. As I scroll through the data fork of the document, I see this is the file I want and the entire file is presented. It is not fragmented. Now I click on the Unerase button. Notice the warning box is telling me that I am trying to unerase to the same disk that I am recovering from. Normally I would not do this, but to expedite our taping, I'm going to tell it to continue anyway. You should always recover information onto a different drive so you don't destroy any data on the original disk you might want to recover. You see that this file has now been recovered. When we return to the finder, we see a new folder called Recovered Files. 
I open that folder and there's another folder called right now 2o files I open that folder and there is my document unerasing will not always be so easy if that file had been fragmented or if the start of the file had been overwritten we would have needed to search for any data within that file found the data on the disk then combine the fragments into a file we could then prepare for our application if the files header was damaged and the application could not accept the file we would also need to perform a more complicated unerase unerase could also help us with lost or orphan files this is data the Mac knows is on the disk but can't connect it with any specific file and fragmented files present us with very interesting data recovery situations showing you these more advanced rescues is beyond the scope of this video but it is not beyond the scope of your workbook why don't you turn to your workbook and review the procedures for performing these rescues so now you should be much more comfortable with how the Mac operating system works with files and you should be comfortable with the sector editor and an unerased program both are very useful tools if data recovery is an important topic for you. Naturally, there are many other things that can go wrong with your data. Hard disks can be accidentally formatted. Viruses can eat up the operating system's bookkeeping areas. Your disk can become fragmented, slowing down its overall operation. The magnetic tracking and sectoring can become weak. These problems are concerns for us in the next section of this video. I've mentioned the term fragmentation a number of times in this video. Fragmentation occurs when a file can no longer expand within its predefined boundaries on the disk. If there are allocated sectors next to it, the expanding file has to go elsewhere to continue its expansion. The Mac OS does not move the entire expanding file. Instead, it notes the location of the fragment in the extents B tree. Now, why should fragmentation bother us? First, it takes longer for the read-write heads to assemble a file. This causes delay in data transfer, as well as extra wear and tear on the drive's hardware. When the file manager requests a bunch of data from a disk drive, it specifies the sector at which to begin reading and how many sectors to read. The drive head has to seek to the correct position. This involves reading every address along the way, much like a delivery courier following addresses along a street. The drive head, once positioned over the correct track, has to wait for the beginning of the first sector it wants to come spinning by. The more often this whole process has to take place, or the worse a file is fragmented, the longer it takes to assemble the data on the drive controller's buffers. Second, should horrible things happen to your disk, such as accidental formatting, a virus, or a power problem during a critical read-write operation, it will be much tougher to piece together your data. Norton's defragger is called speed disk. It automatically defragments your hard disk for you. Speed disk has its own icon in the Norton Utilities window. Speed disk shows us graphically the selected disk's fragmentation. files may not only be fragmented but there can be gaps between allocated sectors places where erase files used to be Norton will not only defragment your disk but will close in those gaps something you do not want to happen if you have files on that disk you need to rescue the program will also note if an allocation block is getting soft meaning its magnetic tracking and sectoring is getting weak therefore threatening the integrity of your data. Speed disk will move any data in weakening allocation blocks to good areas of your disk. Then mark the blocks the data was moved from as bad in the volume bitmap. Doing so will prevent the operating system from using those blocks to store data again. By the way, all this is called optimization. Running speed disk is a great way to optimize your disk. Also, be sure you do a complete backup before you run speed disk for the first time. The program is 99% safe, but 99% is not 100%.
Also, don't turn off the machine during optimization. <laughs> Not unless you want your files scattered all over the disk without a way to find them again. Couple other warnings. If you are going to optimize your startup hard disk, activate speed disk by booting from the Norton applications disk. There can be no open files. MultiFinder keeps the desktop open at all times. Don't run speed disk under MultiFinder. Notice when speed disk begins its work, it verifies the media to be sure there are no bad areas it may write to. This is an important point we will discuss more fully shortly. Then it begins its reading, writing, and re-verification steps. By the way, expert mode displays a pencil that illustrates the writing process. Although this will slow down your optimization, it's great fun to watch. In a few minutes, how many is based on how badly the volume is fragmented, all is back together and ready to go. Now you will find your disk much perkier and in much better shape should a horrible problem occur. We have already discussed the two different types of formatting, low level and your operating system formatting. We know that low level formatting will destroy all data on a hard disk and the max operating system formatting will only reset the max bookkeeping file management structures. It will not actually destroy the data. What happens if you accidentally reinitialize your hard disk? Or a disgruntled employee performs this trick as he or she is walking out the door? Or a computer virus eats up your operating system's bookkeeping? The Mac operating system gives you no help in the event of such a mess. However, commercial utilities can help you out. Norton's format recover uses a utility called file saver to recreate the bookkeeping information of a disk volume at shutdown. Now, go to your workbook to read about how these programs work. The invisible desktop file, we have mentioned a number of times, keeps track of what windows are open, where they've been positioned in the screen, and how they're stacked up. Should a Mac be turned off without shutting down, or a disk ejected, using the command shift one or command shift two keys, the icon positioning information in the leaf records will not match the desktop. This can also happen if your system freezes before the operating system's bookkeeping information is updated. In this case, you will see one of a number of errors such as disk needs minor repairs or sorry, a system error has occurred. Icons may also fail to activate upon selection. Rebuilding the desktop is fairly simple. Restart the machine and hold down command option as the machine boots up. The Mac will ask you if you want to rebuild your desktop. Respond OK and all should be well. Any problem in the boot blocks, just the changing of one byte can render a startup disk useless. Problems in the VIB can crash a system or cause part of a file to be assigned to another file. Even a misplaced catalog tree root can make a disk unusable. You have seen ways using a sector editor in which you can find your way into the affected area and fix the problem. But what if you are not sure of your technical prowess or if you are in a big hurry? Well, call a doctor. What did you expect, Dwight Gooden? No, the Norton Disk Doctor. I have a seriously damaged hard disk here, and oh boy, what a nasty message. Let's place Norton's emergency disk into the floppy drive, then reboot. After we select the disk doctor, it asks us for the volume to diagnose. We will select the hard drive. You see, the doctor checks out six critical parts of the disk. The boot blocks and volume info block, catalog B tree, the links between the catalog and extents B trees, the volume bitmap, lost files, areas marked in the bitmap but not recorded in the catalog B tree, and files themselves, 
looking for virus signatures and incorrect dates, as well as a number of other annoying problems. If the doctor finds any problems in these areas, it will report on the damage. The report tells you what is wrong, what to expect if the problem is not corrected, and a recommendation regarding repair. The fixing of bad startup disks is an excellent candidate for the disk doctor. There are many backup programs commercially available. The more powerful ones will let you back up to both tape and floppies, select files to back up or restore by a number of different criteria, date being one, compress data to save space, write macros, even print labels for your backup disks. If you have up-to-date backups, you won't need a disk doctor or any file recovery software. All you'll need to do is reformat your disk, then restore the backups when things go wrong. If you don't back up your critical data every day, you're just asking for trouble. So far, we have been discussing software-based problems and solutions. Now, we have a chance to get inside the Mac and see how your machine is constructed. By the end of this section, you will be able to troubleshoot simple problems, replace boards, and upgrade your RAM. The more technically inclined will better understand what all the hardware components are and what each one does. Computers are very susceptible to electrostatic discharge, or ESD, which is caused by friction. Basically, ESD is the charge you feel when you walk across a room and touch a doorknob. Just a small static charge, 20 volts, is enough to wound or kill a computer chip. You should wear a static wrist strap at all times when working with electronic components. This strap should, at least, be attached to the computer chassis, but earth ground is better. Touching the chassis will temporarily ground you, but moving around will rebuild the charge. For those of you with compact Macs, make sure that you never wear a wrist strap when discharging high voltage from a CRT. We will be working with both compact and modular Macs. We will start with a member of the SE family, then move to Mac 2. The compact Macs house a CRT powered by a flyback transformer. Both this transformer and the CRT operate on a very high voltage one that can be retained even when powered down, over 9,000 volts, enough to kill you. It takes about half an hour to discharge fully. If you can't wait half an hour to open the machine, be sure you have a discharge tool available. Your modular Macs don't have this problem. They have external monitors connected to a video board inside the machine. But for both types of machines, make sure you notice how the devices are connected before you remove them. You might want to make notes to yourself about where everything fits. Shut down the Mac and remove all power cords. For compact Macs, lay the Mac CRT side down on a soft cloth or mouse pad. Using a Torx 15 screwdriver, remove the four screws in the rear of the unit. With your case cracker, pry open the two halves of the case. First, make sure the alligator clip of the discharge tool is connected to the Mac's chassis. Then, while placing one hand behind your back, slip the probe under the CRT's anode cap until it touches the metal anode clips. Take a wire with two alligator clips 
and attach one end to the anode well area and the other to the chassis. This will dissipate any residual charges. Now, carefully remove this piece from the back of the CRT. Don't bend the tube's connectors or break the glass. Let's remove the CRT and place it in a safe area. Make sure you remove these four screws. And this one's tough to get to. Also be sure to remove the power connector from the analog board. For modular max, flip these two notches and lift the case. The compact max have two circuit boards, the analog board and the digital or logic board. The analog board contains the circuitry for the MAX video screen and power supply. It is mounted vertically along the left side of the case as you face the screen. The MAX power switch is located there and protrudes through a hole in the rear of the case. The digital board contains the CPU, RAM, and ROM chips, as well as various support chips. This board is mounted horizontally at the bottom of the case below the CRT. Modular Max have one board. It is called the system board or motherboard. The connectors for the Max ports are mounted on the rear edge of the logic or system board. The power supply's job is to convert the wall receptacle's AC current to the DC power the MAX integrated circuits require. The power supply also creates other voltages used by the MAX video tube and other components. If your hard drive doesn't spin or there are bad reads and writes on your disks, if external devices don't respond, or the machine reboots at odd times, or you are getting intermittent memory errors if expansion cards don't respond, or the display is dim or shrunken. You might be having power supply problems. Here's the fan. If the fan is not spinning after you turn the machine on, the power supply is dead, or the machine isn't plugged in. For you with Compact Max, Let's remove the logic board first. Be sure to disconnect all cabling. It doesn't hurt to label things as you work. Make sure you don't crimp the cables. Breaking the wires within the cable could render their devices in inoperable. For those of you with modular Max, just pop out the drives, then remove the drive casing. Make sure you've removed the data cable, and it pops right out. With the hard drive, you also have a power cable that has to be removed. And here goes the casing. The casing is installed with four screws. The digital or system board provides the brains of your compact Mac. Crammed into the digital board are the chips and circuits that make your Mac work. 68,000 family microprocessor. This chip handles all program instructions, coordinates circuit activity, and moves data within the system. The number of data bits it can handle internally, the number of bits the computer's bus can handle, determine the throughput of your system. Refer to your workbook for information on CPUs for all members of the Mac family. All these wires attached to the system board are what make up a bus. There are address, data, and power buses. 
there are two ROM chips on this machine. One chip handles the boot up, the other the low level operating system functions. Again, refer to your workbook for details. These are RAM chips mounted on SIMS. On this machine, we have four SIMS. SIM sizes include 256K, 1 meg, and 2 meg. The individual chips on its SIM operate at 120 or 150 nanoseconds. This is how you remove a SIM. And this is how you put it back. Your workbook has suggestions for SIM configuration and upgrading. If you see a sad Mac icon with a 0001E or 010000E error message, you might have a bad RAM chip. Or, for those of you with modular Macs, an unusual sound at boot up can signal memory chip problems. For discussion of some of the other important chips on this board, including tips on SCSI termination and addressing, as well as many other hardware troubleshooting tips, refer to your workbook. Now, we need to put everything back together. Be sure you go in reverse order from your disassembly steps. And be sure that all cables and components are snugly reconnected. We've reached the end of the tape. I hope you have a much better understanding of how your Mac thinks and operates. And I'm sure you have much better ideas of what can go wrong, starting points for your troubleshooting, and more comfort with the tools of the data recovery and troubleshooting trade. I hope the workbook that accompanies this video will serve you as a useful reference source. Have fun, good luck, happy disasters, and most importantly, successful recovery.